we had narrowed it down to three possibilities. It could only be one of these three U-boats. And that was based on information and data that we collected from the submarine. It was actually looking for the Kriegstag book or ship's log. And he was hoping that this box would have that in it. But when he brought the box up, it was nothing more than cutlery, silverware, spoons and knives. The word got out that he had located a Nazi submarine. None of us were prepared for the response. He slid across the table a piece of paper. It says, we know more about our U-boat than they do. It's important to note that post-World War II Germany, most Germans really would wish that everything that had to do with the Third Reich would just go away. One of the divers slapped John on the back and said, you've solved the mystery, John. All you have to do is find Hornberg and now you know. Well, easier said than done. Of the 40,000 men who served on German submarines, there was only one named Hornberg. History X membership has its privileges. To access unedited versions of this and many other History X videos, consider becoming a History X member. And now part two of Hitler's Lost Sub, Mystery of the U-869, with our special guest, deep sea detective, Richie Kohler. Sometimes these things are just rocks, sometimes they're old barges, but Labor Day of 1991, they stumbled on what was arguably the remains of a World War II shipwreck. There was a little bit of an argument. Some people thought it might have been a barge. John Chatterton had thought he saw a torpedo inside it. Do you remember what part of the sub you saw first that you came down upon from your descent? I can, and it's an iconic image aft of the conning tower where the periscopes are. You can see that item sticking up right behind the break. That was the mount for the 37 millimeter anti-aircraft gun. The anchor was tied into that high point on the wreck. When we're tying the boat to the shipwreck, we always seek out the highest point. And as you can see, right aft of the breakage, to the right of the damaged control room, you see this little device sticking up. Well, that was the mount for this 37 millimeter gun. And I came down and I looked at it, and at the time, I didn't know what it was. I had only dove one other German U-boat before, and that was a Type 7 that was off, the, off North Carolina. It doesn't look anything like this. Yes, it's a submarine, but they're totally different. I remember seeing all of these objects and committing them to memory. And as I mentioned earlier, one of the key points is to come away with photographs or video and then compare it to historical or construction photos. And that's how you can help make an ID of a shipwreck by its type or style. Yeah, these are all my images. That, that's an image inside the diesel motor room. If you look carefully, you're looking at a workbench in the center and you can actually see a vice yeah. sitting on the workbench. And surrounding you are some of the fixtures that were part of the interior ventilation and exhaust system for the two diesel engines, mm -hmm. which would be to the left of this photograph. You guys have been going down there. You're bringing back plates. You're bringing back items. You're bringing back stories. How long until the word really gets out that you guys are onto something? Well, actually, when John Chatterton surfaced with the dishes, the boat's owner, Bill Nagel, called the Star Ledger, which is the, one of the largest newspapers in New Jersey, and told them that he had located a Nazi submarine. He did it because, number one, he knew that boat captains were going to be coming out to the wreck because the word got out after the second trip and there was a diving fatality when Stephen Thelman died. And so now the word was out that he had found a submarine. As I mentioned earlier, it was a competitive business running a dive boat. You wanted to have people come on your boat the same way that any other business wants to get all the patrons they can. And so he wanted to make sure that the word was out. Bill Nagel and the Seeker identified this as a Nazi U-boat. None of us were prepared for the response. It must have been a slow 
Newsday because it made the front page of the Star Ledger. All of a sudden, area newscasters came down and Bill and John were on the local news that night. They stayed in touch with us for a few months, but when no identity was forthcoming, their attention waned. But they, they kind of stayed in touch with us as the years went by. One of the things that we did was we would reach out, primarily myself and John Chatterton, but there was a number of other people that did a lot of the ground work, meaning going down to the National Archives, contacting historians, going to the U-505 Museum, a German U-boat that's in Chicago, Illinois, and looking at it to, to learn more about German U-boats. One of my contributions was to reach out to the Ministry of Defense in Scotland Yard concerning German radio transmissions. And, you know, this was one of the things that we were trying to figure out was how did a U-boat get all the way to America and no one knows that. We had been told by other historians and archivists slash experts that the Ministry of Defense in Scotland Yard basically holds all of the English records of their Enigma decrypts, basically eavesdropping and decrypting German radio messages. And so I became friends with a curator there, a gentleman named Robert Coppock. And this was before the internet, boys. This was, we were operating with fax machines and letters. My first contact to Robert Kopek was a letter in the mail, in the mail. And then he mailed me back. And then we did that for a while until we realized we could fax each other. So you can realize how slow the process was of getting information. But it truly created an international connection of people that were interested, much like you guys, in naval history. But their area was German U-boats. And we enlisted their aid. And they realized that we were the sharp end of the stick. Every one of them said the same thing to us. The answer is on the U-boat. Go find it. They pointed us in different directions and, and, and different ways. Some helped us. Some didn't bear any fruit. But one of the things about it that jokingly makes us detectives was the fact that we had to keep narrowing down the field. We were going to the wreck finding items, finding objects, taking measurements, coming back, and using that to eliminate the possibilities of which submarine this could be. And as people who've read the book understand about the difficulty of going 60 miles offshore and 230 feet down, there were some seasons. We only got three days out on the wreck. That's it. Three days of a year. And so you had to make a count. And then you would come back and you would do your research and follow up with that. And so prior to actually finding a tag which identified the wreck, we had narrowed it down to three possibilities. It could only be one of these three U-boats. And that was based on information and data that we collected from the submarine. Well, and, and let me jump to that because I consider it actually one of the creepier parts of the story. This is the handle of a steak knife with a sailor's name carved in it. And now all of a sudden you've got not just an item like a plate, but you actually have an item with a name. And as soon as this was brought out in the Nova documentary, it, it gives you chills because now all of a sudden here's a name. Was it you or John that discovered the knife? It was John. John had recovered a box from the area of the office's quarters. He wasn't looking for silverware. He was actually looking for the... Kriegstag book or KTB, which is basically the ship's log. Mm -hmm. And we had it on good authority that the ship's log was kept in a box adjacent to the captain's quarters. And he was hoping that this box would have that in it. But when he brought the box up, it was nothing more than cutlery, silverware, spoons and knives. And only one of those knives had a wooden handle. And you're looking at it and it had the name Hornberg. And one of the divers on the trip that day slapped John on the back and said, you've solved the mystery, John. All you have to do is find Hornberg, and now you know. And so that's exactly what we did. We wrote to the equivalent of the German Veterans Administration in Germany, which is called the VOST organization. 
and ask for any information. And now the problem is they were loath to give anything to anybody, even in America. I'm pretty sure you can't just run to the Veterans Administration and say, hey, tell me about Joe Blow. You know, they're not going to do that. So we had to enlist a little bit of aid from other archivists and historians that had some credibility. And then we were able to find out there was only one German sailor. Orenberg is a very uncommon name. And there was only one of the 40,000 men who served on German submarines. There was only one named Orenberg. And Orenberg served on a submarine that was sunk off Casablanca. And so our experts, once again, told us, well, the knife is a dead end. Maybe somebody stole the knife. Maybe at one point, Horenberg was on this submarine. Who knows? But Horenberg and his boat are sunk off Casablanca. So that was a dead end. At least that's what the records showed. That is absolutely correct. That, yeah, that- it was like Rabat or something like that. Correct. And you're approaching all these different people that might be able to provide some information and one of the people that you approach is this guy. Horse bred out. Right. And he was really dubious about what you guys were bringing to the table because, yeah, here's a knife. Hornberg's name is carved into it, but Hornberg went down off of Rabat, off the northwestern corner of Africa. Absolutely correct. So the gentleman that's on screen right now runs an organization. He used to, he's passed called the U-Boat Archive in Cuxhaven. And this is not a state or government funded organization. It is basically like our version of the U.S. Subvets, which is a private veteran run, veteran funded organization. And it's important to note that post-World War II Germany, most Germans really would wish that everything that had to do with the Third Reich would just go away. And yet, Horst Bredow, who was a young man who survived, felt compelled to keep the memory of the U-boat sailors alive. And he created this repository for everything U-boat. And it's not just artifacts. Artifacts are a very small part of it. It is reams and reams of paper. It is logs. It is photographs. It is personal stories. It is diaries. It is some of the personal photographs that sailors took and sent home to their families, and then the families don't know what to do with them. And so he has collected them, and he's collected all of these images. And as you correctly said, when we told him about the knife, he said, the knife is a dead end. Horenberg isn't on that submarine. Horenberg is off North Africa. And so you have to go back to the wreck. And that's exactly how you put it. You have to go back to the wreck. And that's exactly what we did. Was he supportive or was he kind of a jerk? He was supportive, but, and I can forgive his, I don't say indifference, but you have to realize that, it's going to sound crazy, but you mentioned U-boats and all of a sudden the nuts come out of the, I don't know what it is about German submarines, but it just brings out a lot of crazy people. And what I mean by that is you've got, People that are uh, convinced that Hitler escaped uh, uh, to South America, that Nazi U-boats were loaded with gold and and priceless art, and every U-boat is filled with gold, and it's just craziness. And and, and I think that you guys have a great appreciation for military operations and the understanding of that. That's not to say that submarines didn't transport gold here or there, but there, there are people that believe every time the submarines found that it was carrying Hitler and gold. Believe it or not, we actually thought that too at the beginning because it's like, hey, submarine that nobody can explain. So we went through that little phase and Horace Bredo had to deal with that on a regular basis. Crazy people pestering him or calling up with phantom U-boat stories until we were able to literally show him video, which we did, and bring artifacts to him from the U-boat itself. Then he realized that, hey, these guys really do have a mystery. And he did everything he could to assist us. But as John as John so eloquently says in the book Shadow Divers, he had spent a week in Germany and met with Horst Bredow. I could not accompany him on that first trip. And Horst Bredow slid across the table a piece of paper with the number of five different U-boats. And he said, it has to be one of these U-boats. 
John looked at the list and he wrote me a postcard and sent it to me from Germany. I still have it to this day. And it says, we know more about our U-boat than they do. It couldn't possibly have been any of the U-boats that Horace brought out had said it was. He was believing it was one of the U-boats that had been lost and sunk off America, but that the U.S. Navy had made a mistake of its location by hundreds of miles. That made a simpler answer. Kind of like the way I approached it. And I said, hey, look, there's an American submarine in the area. It must be an American submarine. I think Horace Bredow looked at it and goes, hey, there's five U-boats lost off the East Coast. It's got to be one of these. And so it was, I think, an oversimplification. I actually cold called. Coming up in part three. Here in Boston. You could hear the phone get silent for a minute. And I said to her, it's a bullshit story. There's, there's no U-boat in Boston Harbor. Continue on to part three of this history exploration of Hitler's lost sub, the U-869, with deep sea detective Richie Kohler. <laughs>